Reacting to Auburn's scrimmage this weekend, there are two players we're not talking enough about. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby, and thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. Joining me as he does every single Monday, it is the Lindsey Crosby of AuburnDaily.com, as well as a million other places, truly. Lindsey, we'll talk about how this fall camp has changed expectations for the Tigers as well as the offensive tackle situation, which was a huge narrative throughout the weekend. Mm -hmm. But diving in and reacting to the the news and the tidbits and the discussions we've had with folks within the program about Saturday's scrimmage, there are two guys that I don't think we're discussing enough. With this fall camp and really the entire offseason being about Auburn's wide receiver room and all the attention that Cam Coleman and Perry Thompson and Bryce Kane and Malcolm Simmons even the new addition of Keandre Lambert-Smith. There's been so many new receivers that are worthy uh, of of the praise and of the excitement. Mm -hmm. But towards the last half of fall camp, we keep hearing Robert Lewis and Sam Jackson. It sounds like both of them had very, very exciting days at the scrimmage on Saturday. Sounds like Peyton Thorne made a lot of really good throws when the scrimmage was outside. It started raining. They moved inside, and then the defense started to kind of pick it up, it sounds like. But transfer receiver from Georgia State, Robert Lewis, and then the former Cal quarterback who transferred to Auburn to be a receiver, Sam Jackson, sounds like they continue to have strong falls. Yeah, I mean, both of them fit the profile of a guy that you'd want to put inside, and you would hope that they would have a good relationship with your QB because they're the closest receivers to the quarterback. If you have an issue, especially with... The offensive tackle thing, we'll talk about that later. Uh, Having these shifty guys in the interior helps out. And I think you kind of get the best of both worlds here because Robert Lewis is the tenured veteran, right? I think he started with 32 career games at at Georgia State. A lot. I mean, yeah, has their single game receiving record. Um, I mean, he something like 1,200 yards in his career, 16 touchdowns. And so he knows how to be a successful college wide receiver. He knows all the tips and tricks. And then Sam Jackson played quarterback, but usually the guys, I feel like the guys that transition from quarterback back to like into receivers typically understand coverages better and how to get open better. And there is a thing I've talked about where he has a pre-existing relationship with, um, with Peyton Thorne because they've been together in the past. And so you've got guys that, chemistry, understand how to get open, understand how to read defenses and do the right thing. And ideally, guys that are going to do the same thing that Peyton Thorne is going to do. And I think the experience with being on the offensive side of the ball for multiple years is what's going to give you that. And I think Mm -hmm. that's a part that you didn't have last year, but it should give you the confidence that Auburn's going to be able to move the chains when they need to. We're going to have a guy they can make a connection to when they need to. Yeah, Sam Jackson scored a touchdown on a fade which is worth noting. It also sounds like Keandre was effective. Keandre Lambert Smith was effective in the middle of the field, which mm-hmm. is, um, which is obviously something exciting. Mike O'Reilly had a, had a few kind of dump offs into the flats, which is what I think we were all screaming that we needed more of in the offense a year ago, safety outlets for the quarterback. Um, mentioned Robert Lewis, including some stuff on third down. And then uh, Camden Brown found the end zone on a deep ball which I've talked to a few folks and it sounds like Camden Brown had a really strong week of practice as well, as far as starting to put it together. And we heard Mm -hmm. Hugh Freeze talk about competition in the wide receiver room. And it's just, that could be the type of thing that Cam Brown needed in order to kind of feel pushed or, you know, Hey, if he takes so much pride in being a leader, Camden does. And I kind of wonder if he's like, the best way for me to lead these young guys that are going to be really special for Auburn is for me to be better and compete with them. And I kind of wonder if that's kind of been his reason for answering the call, but we spent so much of the off season. Okay. You need one or two of these guys to step up Lindsay. And it seems like they all are to some extent, which is the best case scenario for Auburn. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
anybody who complains that you don't know who you're going to throw out there uh, on the first snap of the first game doesn't quite understand, one, how much receivers rotate, right? You're going to have, if you got five or six playable guys, well, guess what? You're going to have plenty of opportunities to play them that much. But then two, you're going to lose some guys. It, it, yeah. I feel like I said this every single week, like depth will always work itself out. If you have too many mouths to feed, something will happen where one of those players will no longer be an option, right? Somebody will get injured. Something will happen. And knowing that all of these guys are one driven by the competition of there's other dudes in here who could pass me. Sure. And, and like having multiple options at every position is great. Keandre Lambert Smith could absolutely kick inside if you needed somebody uh, to take over in the slot. But knowing that both, uh, both Robert Lewis and Sam Jackson are firing on all cylinders right now means that and Bryce Kane and Bryce Kane. Yeah. You've got three guys all with similar that 510. I think Bryce Kane's like 150. The rest of them are like 188 or so. But uh, all those guys that fit the profile of a slot receiver that you don't have to play somebody out of position. Because if you move a guy, all of a sudden now you've technically weakened two spots because he's probably not going to be as good at his other position. And then the guy replacing him at his primary position also won't be as good having high quality depth like this. And a lot of guys that are options at that position, high, high level options means that if you lose somebody, you don't weaken the rest of the lineup around them trying to replace them. Yeah. Solid notes about Jarquez Hunter having a good day running the ball as well. But then the other side of it, you know, we, we mentioned it started to rain. So they moved the scrimmage to the indoor facility. And it just sounds like that on the defensive side of the ball, Amaris Williams and Demarcus Riddick were, were they were a problem. Mm -hmm. Just getting after the opposing quarterbacks from a pass rush standpoint, those two guys apparently were issues over and over and over again. And it sounds like Williams won a lot of folks over um, this weekend. So to me, and this will open up the conversation we're about to have, but it's just the the, the edge rushing on the defensive side of the ball is just in such a better spot than I expected it to be at this point in the year. I, I'm blown away by it. Yeah, I've been talking about you've got Kieran Crawford's your great second guy behind Jalen McLeod, and then we said behind that, you've got three freshmen. You're going to have to play one of them. You don't know who it's going to be. In this case, Amaris Williams stepping up and kind of being that guy. And then Demarcus Riddick, he's listed at linebacker. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a situation where if, if you can rush the passer, you can rush the passer. It doesn't matter where you play or what size you are. We can find yeah. a way to use you. Uh, and I, I feel like you can never have enough, enough options for pass rushing. Not in the SEC. In no. 2024 with this, this type of offense that everybody, you don't see a ton of those uh, so, you know 70% run, three yards in a cloud of dust things anymore. It's a lot of spread. It's a lot of rushing. You need... Honestly, as many pass rushing options as you can get. That's why you brought in three guys in the same class and a transfer in Kieran Crawford. And it feels like you, you, based on just this week, there's hope that Amaris Williams wouldn't be a step down if he had to step into a, a starting lineup for the rest of a game or something like that because of an injury. Sounds like he's learning faster than maybe we were expecting initially in camp, ball camp. Yeah, and... I don't love the idea of having to rely on freshman pass rushers. Right. But if he's the fourth pass rusher in no particular order behind Keldrick Falk, behind Jalen McLeod, behind Kieran Crawford, and then it's Amaris. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Cause then it also kind of helps you build your program to the future. So take that for what it's worth. But yeah, the, the discussion about the step forward with the pass rushers, is that making it, Easier or more difficult to gauge the success and failures of the offensive tackles? It was a big talking point over the weekend. We dive into that in just a moment. Right here on Locked On Auburn. Lindsay, quick question. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine wagering anywhere other than our friends at FanDuel? I could never. I was trying to wager today. Do you know where I did it? FanDuel, because I couldn't FanDuel. imagine doing it anywhere else. I mean, you've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel. Lindsay, I, I, I pre-read this read. We got a new copy. Oh, gosh. And this, this ad read, just get ready, because you don't know where it's going. Okay. FanDuel is one step ahead of the game 
at all times. Okay. We've got something a little different for you. Now through September 22nd, that's over a month, all FanDuel customers can bet $5. What do you think I'm about to say next? Bet $5 you and what? Get bonus tw- bets, right? Get 25 in bonus bets. Yeah, sure. They've done hundreds before. That's where I thought, no. Yeah. You get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. What? Thanks, FanDuel. That's $5 awesome. That? I'll tell you right now, I pay for that, and it is not $5, Lindsay. It, it that is a lot more than $5. dollars service. And Ooh. if you win your bet, it's practically free. That's it free is money. Free. That's, That's what I'm so right practically there. about it. Yeah, so uh, with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game, and all you need is a Google account, which everyone has. That's free. And a current form of payment, and you can cancel anytime. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. I told you. Thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day and all the everydayers out there. Make sure Locked On SEC or Locked On College Football. Consider them to be your second listen of the day. So Hugh Freeze's Friday morning presser, the biggest takeaway to me was, he, you know, I was wrong. I, he was not calling out Dylan Wade. He was indirectly, it sounds like, calling out Percy Lewis. And Ferg and I discussed that on, uh, on Saturday's Locked On Auburn if you want to go and check that out. Um, but the interesting thing about this is like, okay, you start hearing all these rumblings about how the offensive tackles have struggled. You don't really hear anything about too tall, Xavier Miller. It's really been all about Percy Lewis. And then he tells media later in the day on Friday that he's taking reps as backup right tackle and Tyler Johnson's getting reps at left tackle, or maybe they're moving Dylan Wade around. So we'll see what, exactly what happens with that. But I did speak to somebody within the program. And I think it's interesting. I, I said to them, I, I was just asking about the, the scrimmage and as well as a few other things, and specifically the offensive tackles. And his response back, he, he asked the question back, and he said, um, what did I think about the tackles a year ago? And I said, too tall was fine, especially with how raw he was. And then Dylan Wade was, was they, they, were, they were solid. And he said, well, worst case, Zach, worst case, we still have both of them. So like that's the worst case scenario. We're going to kind of try several different things. So to me, like I don't think the sky is falling because Auburn's offensive tackles um, situation isn't as good as we thought it was. And maybe Percy Lewis is a little bit behind of where we thought. But it is weird that it took them this long to start doing this. Like that that's my question and all of this. So, to, but I, I don't think it's this major issue because I do think worst case is you get the, the tackles that you had a year ago, but it's just weird that it took all off season for them to get to this point. Well, I mean, in the last segment, we talked about how it was two freshman pass rushers mm-hmm. that were the ones being exciting. And it feels like when you watch freshmen, the super talented freshmen, there's always like a, a just a day randomly where that switch will flip. And after that, it feels like they are, a lot more dominant, a lot more confident in what they're doing than they were before. And now yeah. some of them, Cam Coleman flipped that switch like on day two, right? Sure. Uh, some players still haven't flipped the switch, have the ability to, and you know, and maybe they're stuck down the quarterback depth chart right now and haven't done it yet. Uh, but it, it, it feels like maybe some of it is that. Maybe some of it is kind of a combination of situations, right? You get them inside, they're on yeah. turf instead of grass. That's a noted faster surface. It's going to benefit a speed rusher. And then maybe, maybe he just had a bad day. I mean, it, it, it would make sense that a man that's six, seven, uh, I'm sure I get this right, 355 would have a little bit of trouble with a speed rusher. But at the same time, how many times are you going to play indoors on turf all season? So it might not be a situation that can translate to the regular season. And like you said, worst case scenario, You've got the existing tackle still here, and then there's ways to mitigate it, whether it's a tight end chip, shifting protections, things like that. I'm not as worried about it. I'm 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 choosing, I'm choosing joy. I'm choosing to think of this as our pass rushers are just that much better. They flipped the switch in the last week, and he was just surprised by the new speed that they found. What makes you wonder? I mean, anytime, Anytime Hugh Freeze shouts somebody out when he ne- maybe doesn't necessarily have to, I think he is telling us something. 
Right. And he's probably telling the player publicly, like, keep doing what you're doing. And he said, Connor Lou's doing a great job. Also, shout out to Tyler Johnson. He's back. And Ronan Chambers has been really good for us. And so you think about where those guys play. Well, Ronan Chambers play like everywhere at Akron. That was part of the kind of argument for keeping him, which I was a little harsh on. I take that and I was wrong. But it's like, okay, is he is he getting reps at tackle? To me, he looks more like a guard, but he played tackle at Akron. He played everywhere at Akron. And then Tyler Johnson, I mean, I spent extra time watching him in the Friday viewing window just because of Hugh Freeze's comments. And it's like him, Percy, and Azavian, those three tackles, like they all look just alike. Like they are just huge men who move so, so well. And it's like, yeah, yeah I'd have a hard time getting past him if, if I was uh if I was a defensive pass rusher. So I don't know exactly what Freeze is saying with those two guys. I don't know if he's saying, okay, well, it's Ronan Chambers because they're going to scoot Dylan Wade back from guard to tackle and let Ronan be the guard there. Or if they're going to keep Wade at guard, which is what I would want, and then to put Tyler Johnson at tackle. I think that's kind of an interesting discussion. Are either of those options better than what we thought it was going to be with Percy Lewis at left tackle and Dylan Wade at left guard? I don't know. That's for the coaches to decide, but it does sound like they're trying to do things. Yeah, I I do appreciate the fact that you have options. I do think we need to have some perspective on this, and we no need to kidding. look back and think about going into last season. You know, the end of the two two years ago, the end of that off season, we didn't know if you would have five scholarship offensive linemen. Like that's how bad things had gotten. And I kind of wish I was joking with that. We had questions about if people transfer and things like that. You may not have a starting five. So yeah. perspective is nice, but it is good to have options. Uh, I mean, and this is not another depth will work itself out rant, uh, but this is kind of an acknowledgement that you've got you know, Tyler Johnson's a redshirt freshman, fr- freshman offensive lineman. Like people kind of, because Connor alluded it last year, a lot of the Auburn fan base feels like they are expecting a lot of the freshmen to do that. And they, I think you need to understand that is incredibly rare. The ability mm-hmm. for Connor to come in and take over a starting spot in his freshman year. And so right. Tyler Johnson's on the development timeline to take a to have the switch flip, to take a jump, and all of a sudden be a dude. And it, maybe it's just he is that much better. And so he's getting the shout out because he has dramatically improved over what they saw uh, in spring or even mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago. But either way, I think we have enough people who we know can play the position where I want Percy Lewis to work out. I want him to be the best left tackle we've had in a long time. Sure. I'm not freaking out if he can't be because we have enough options where we can get through a season without that being a glaring weakness. I also love that, you know, with, with the NIL age that we're in, I mean, you assume he was one of the top tackles in the portals. Like you assume, you assume he's being taken care of. And I love that the staff isn't like, well, we've got, we got, he's got to make it work or it's just like, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like they're actually like having a legit battle there. My question is like, why did it take this long into the process? Were they just hoping it would click? I don't know. I don't know. So I I do think that's the interesting question to ask, but regardless, I do think like worst case is Dylan Wade's at tackle again. Um, that may not even be worst case. I don't know. Like, is that is he better at left tackle right now than Tyler Johnson is? I'd be a little surprised if that was the case. Yeah. But I don't know. Like Tyler Johnson, we hear nothing but we've heard nothing but how much the staff loves him since they got here. And was it because like he was a little banged up and because Free said that he's finally back? Like, is that why it took so long? For Percy Lewis, for you know, for them to feel this way, because now Tyler Johnson was an option. I don't know, but it's worth following for sure. Hey, yeah, we, we discussed all of this like almost in real time at the bar in Auburn.com. Um, all the scrimmage notes as well as speculation and, and rumor. Um nobody had more. scrimmage notes like y'all had on, that was no, amazing. It wasn't even close. It wasn't even close. In fact, a lot of people kind of said, Hey, we're we've been at other places. We're coming here because of what y'all did on Saturday. So check that out. The bar Auburn.com. Charlie five's killing it. You're dropping a lot of baseball nuggets in there as well. I'm dropping some stuff in there. So that's going to be at the bar Auburn.com. It's been interesting how this fall camp 
really, I think it's changed expectations for this team this season. Is that fair? We discuss in just a moment right here on Locked On Auburn. Lindsay, I, I, I just can't imagine. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Okay. And I can't imagine just sitting in my home thinking, oh my goodness, I need a, I need a, I need a part for my car, truck, SUV, it doesn't matter what it is. And I, I guess I'm going to go drive over to the store in a vehicle that needs a part and hope that they have it knowing good and well they don't. But I could just go to ebaymotors.com, spend less money, know that the part's going to fit no matter what, and just have that peace of mind. I can't imagine doing anything other than that. The peace of mind's a thing for me. I, <clears throat> I put in new headlights in my Jeep Wrangler on Saturday, and I didn't have to worry about, hey, are these going to fit? Mm-hmm. Like, are these, mm-hmm. is this the right part for my Jeep? No, because right. eBay Motors gave me the eBay guaranteed fit promise. Had that little green check mark next to it when yep. you ordered it. So keep your ride or die live at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusion supply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Thank you for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team. Every day, Lindsay, when you look at expectations for this season, I think across the board, I mean, the average Auburn fan, I mean, some Auburn fans thought they were going 10 and two before and think they're going 10 and two or 11 and one after, which I don't think is realistic, but Hey, I hope you're right. I was, I was waffling between seven and five and eight and four going into fall camp. And now I'm pretty solidly at eight and four with like, you can kind of see the path to, to a nine and three that doesn't seem crazy do you think it's fair do you think it's fair that okay even though like there hasn't been a whole lot of public access and we haven't really seen them go full speed hardly at all do you think it's fair for the expectations to be up on the sovereign team i think first of all it does make sense that you're feeling more positive vegas feels the same way i remember seeing lines of six and a half over the like, on the win total the season win total uh, really? and right and right now FanDuel has it at seven and a half wins. That's the, that's the, and the money is, I mean, over under seven and a half. So it makes sense. I think everything that we've heard from you, from Charlie Five, from other folks, from other websites who have tried to catch up to where you guys are on the coverage of these things, a lot of Auburn's issues from last season feel like, even if they're not completely fixed, they're much better. You have a deeper rotation at pass rusher. You yeah. have, you've significantly upgraded the receiver room. You, the offensive line, we talked about if your plan doesn't work, you can fall back to what you did last year. Yeah. So a lot of Auburn's fine. issues have been addressed in a positive way, and it really doesn't feel like there's many areas with which you subtract the talent versus adding talent. Yeah. And so I think it makes sense to have a little bit more faith that the pieces are there to beat the projection. Now, whether or not Auburn actually does it, obviously, is entirely up to, you know, does the play calling remain consistent? Does Peyton Thorne get his... Like, there's a lot of variables that go into it, but you've addressed just about every single area of weakness as you go into year two of Hugh Freeze, and it feels like not many teams or rosters in the SEC can say that they've done that. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody still has some sort of glaring hole on the in the program, whether it's the coaching staff, whether it's recruiting, whether it's the roster, running backs at Texas. I mean, there's something everywhere for everybody. Auburn feels like you've addressed all of your main issues and you have a much better talent of players to work with. Yeah. Yeah. The two big questions I had were pass rush and wide receiver. And I thought it was pretty big when Hugh Freeze came out on Friday and said he was stoked about, you know, how far the receivers were going to be. And I forget his exact phrasing, but he said the receivers are going to be fine. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wow. Okay. I mean, that's a position group he's been hard on since, since he got here. Like, that's, that felt, that felt good. It felt nice. And then the, the pass rush is the same thing. It's like, that, that's kind of, that's still what we're hearing. I think it's kind of still hard to gauge because it's like, well, if the tackles are struggling, how do we know? How do we know if the pass rush is really there? So that I'm still on a like, let's wait and see. But man, it's so it's such a better situation 
than what I thought it would be, mm-hmm. especially leaving. You know, I remember walking off the field. Daryl and I recorded our our reaction podcast on the field, and we were walking off. And I'm still like, I told him, I, I don't know what we're gonna do from a pass rushing standpoint. I'm not asking that question anymore. I don't think it's gonna be some like major weakness. Is it gonna right. be as strong as some people are projecting? I'm not quite there yet. I hope so, but I'm I'm just not quite there yet. But I don't think it's gonna be like this non sec caliber pass rush, which I did think leaving spring. And so to me, I thought Auburn was a seven and five team with very low expectations for the pass rush. And a lot of questions about the receiving game. Feel pretty good about the receiving game. Feel a lot better about the pass rush. You've got to add a win in there. You have to go from seven to five to eight and four, as far as what you're predicting. Now, then I think you got to look at the schedule and say, okay, who is that extra win? against i personally think it's oklahoma i didn't think auburn would beat oklahoma in march now i do now i do think auburn beats oklahoma so to me that's where your other game is and the the timing of that i think makes a ton of sense with them coming to jordan Hare and also like okay what a better opportunity to just kind of say okay where's your pass rush versus uh, a team that's revamping their entire offensive line so i think there's a mismatch potential there as well so yeah, I mean, I think it's totally fair that Auburn uh, that Auburn's expectations have gone up this fall camp. Yeah, and and the things that can affect stuff on the margins, right? Whether it's special teams play, whether it's the coaching staff and the play calling, yeah, a lot of those things have seen improvement too. You're bringing back your punter, right? You have a you you were able to weather an injury, essentially an injury at kicker, and bring in a talented kicker. You have so you have options here. You know, the, the, some of the extra things, some of your returners now, you know, some of these freshmen might get a chance to return and they have blazing speed. Like the little things that can push a borderline game from a toss up into a win have all mm-hmm. gotten better, right? I don't think Hugh Freeze calling plays is worth two or three additional wins in a season, but do I think it could maybe swing two or three plays in a game? Yes. And do yeah. I think that there will be a game out there that you probably would have lost? If not for those two or three plays, I do. And so I think you can kind of explain if it happens, you can see where you can, we're going to be able to look back and say, this is the game where making this offseason change gave Auburn a victory where you wouldn't have had it last year. And that's a nice place to be because, like you coming out of spring, I didn't quite know if we were going to have all of those little hidden edges that could add up for another victory in the schedule. But it feels like mm-hmm. you are now. And so, Seven and a half on FanDuel, folks. Go go after. Yeah, I think hammer the over. The over. Hammer the over. the over. And you get YouTube. Uh, you get uh, NFL Sunday ticket. Which is, it's a win win all around, guys. Yeah, there's no reason not to do it. No you question. Can wake up Sunday morning, listen to Zach Blackerby and Daryl Dapper to recap the game, and then you can watch sure. NFL on FanDuel's dime because for they free. were dumb enough to set a too low line for Auburn football in 2020. There you go. I mean, that is just that's the world we get to live in, folks. Lindsay, how can people check out everything you've got going on? Ooh, it's a list here. I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. You can find the writing bravesoday.com, auburndaily.com, and mm-hmm. the daily MLB recap show, First Pitch, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Y'all are doing such a great job with that. Be sure to check that out. Yeah, uh, all of my scoops are at thebarnauburn.com. Please like the video. Please subscribe. And we'll see you next time. This has been Locked on Auburn.